Hello everyone. In this episode, we're going to look at comparative economic development in the very long run over centuries. And the key focus here will be on thinking about and understanding the role of institutions in explaining economic growth and development performance. And you will find that this is based on section 2.8 in chapter two of the textbook. Um, it's a rather um, dense section and it's really worth going through it you know, paragraph by paragraph but I'm going to summarize the key points by means of the diagram. Presented there, first of all, just very quickly to say something about the nature as well as the role of economic institutions. So we hear institutions used in a variety of ways. We call the World Bank an institution, but really that's a misnomer with respect to what we mean by institutions within development economics. Here we follow the framework of Nobel laureate Doug North. So he'll be my Nobel laureate of the day. Um, he created an analysis, which is widely followed on institutions, thinking of these as the rules of the game of economic life. So economic life here, you should think about uh, much more broadly than just the functioning of markets. It's um, applicable to a wide range of social interactions. And so the salient institutions, rules of the game, include both formal institutions and informal institutions. Among formal ones, they include formal property rights based upon law. Um, what kind of rights? Contract enforcement. Can you create a contract and just w walk away from it? Or are there obligations that are legally enforceable? Um, restrictions of coercive, fraudulent, competitive behavior. In other words, to what extent are these really free and open markets as um, compared to uncompetitive ones? Um, provision of access to opportunities of the broadest um, group of the population. Um, and constraints on executive authority, another very important one. All of these are thought of as good institutions in the sense of, uh, of uh, creating incentives for, for investment and for constructive economic behavior, if you want. And all of these, in some form, have been found to be effective in helping to spur investment and, ultimately, economic development. So, but just in, importantly, informal norms matter also, right? So what's considered um, a good citizen behavior? Uh, what's emphasized, um, what's not? And we'll see some examples of that uh, really throughout the class. So that the greater emphasis um, here is going to be on formal institutions at this point. And so that this uh, a diagram, um, I think that it's uh, figure 2.9 in the text, but you'll find it in the textbook. I've um, uh, blown this up so that I hope it'll be uh, pretty easy to, uh, to, easy enough to see, at least by zooming in. But if not, you might want to look along with the diagram from your book while I go through some of these um, um, points. So all of these points and some others are spelled out in detail in the section. This will just be some core highlights if you want, but not the only important one. So uh, the idea is that in thinking about successful economic development in a broad sense over the very long run, widely people in general think that it has something to do with physical geography and in physical geography thinking about climate you know tro tropical subtropical and so on um, temperate and so there's very little doubt that in the very long run physical geography in this sense has had great effect on um, the type of civilizations that emerged and um, so on and so if you want to go back to the pre-modern era, I'm going to call the modern era, we're going to give a cutoff of, of the year 1500, but it might, uh, you know, we, we could quibble, of course, about the exact timing, 1500. Um, you know, up to 1500, there's no doubt that geography had an enormous influence in the way that societies, cultures, civilizations developed. Uh, you know, a, a brilliant explication of this is found in um, Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, for example, right? But the key question now is to what extent did geography matter in the modern epic, and, and in particular, past 1500, 
right? Um, at the uh, uh, end of the 18th century, when the possibilities for developing through industrialization came in, at that point, was geography still determinative or not? And so that's basically the question. So to get at that question, we start with the physical geography, in, uh, including climate. And then there's this arrow, one that points to this um, bottom box of our ultimate concern, um, which is uh, uh, income and human development. And so what the analysis has shown in the last couple of decades, as economists have looked very carefully at these um, questions in some new ways, is that after you do a thorough job of analyzing the role, the causal role of institutions in explaining the pattern of economic development, there's actually not that much left over that can be explained by geography. Now this is a little bit nuanced because there's some debate about this. Um, one of the best known examples is the debate about how much uh, how much uh, um, uh, the presence of malaria as a kind of geographic um, influence directly affects income opportunities, development opportunities um, today. The evidence here is, um, is mixed. There's some, uh, there's some evidence that suggests a presence of malaria causes lower levels of development. And as, as a result of a study like that one, the arrow is, um, is uh, still here. There are a couple other geographic variables that some studies suggest are very important. A key example is landlocked status for the country. Although when looked at more carefully, it is found that what really matters is that you are landlocked and have bad neighbors, right? So no one thinks Switzerland has troubles just because it's landlocked. So this is less, uh, less, less clear. So I'm going to focus now on um, the role of institutions in explaining uh, kind of the history of much of economic development globally, um, but also as a, um, a, a variable in determining possibilities for economic development um, today. And so that, as I say, there, there's no doubt that in the long run, um, the um, role of geography was, um, was very important. But how do we get at this role of institution? So geography is exogenous, you know, you don't uh, decide whether you live in, you know, whether your, your environment is mountainous or on a seashore or tropical, you know, or, you know, on a, in a um, temperate lake area, right? So that's given exogenously. Institutions, on the other hand, are not really um, ex exogenous in the sense that some of the institutions I was talking about, like having a, you know, essentially having a courts system capable of enforcing property rights, so people aren't just arbitrarily expropriated or enforcing contract, um, uh, legally bound, you know, binding contracts and so on. Well, you know, it costs something to maintain such a, um, a, a viable system of, um, of law. And so rich societies can afford better institutions, and that's one example of one. Um, so that it, as a result, it's not just that institutions might create higher income, good institutions create higher income, but higher income may, might make it possible to have better institutions. Or these two factors, institutions and high level of development could be caused by a third factor, can be mutually causal. So we have to try to unpack this and see if we can find some clear evidence in the data that there's actually a causal relationship between institutions on the one hand and development outcomes on the other. And so this is where development economists have to really focus hard on the, um, the, on the uh, econometric um, analysis. And so that uh, um, nearly 20 years ago now, um, um, Asimov, awesome Johnson, and Robinson wrote a couple of uh, very influential papers in this area. And so the idea was that we cannot, of course, have a randomized control trial, like a drug trial, um, with uh, uh, institutions for countries, right? So we can, we can with, with uh, willing um, volunteers, um, do a randomized test for um, whether uh, COVID-19 um, uh, inoculation uh, vaccine works uh, or not, 
Well, we, we certainly cannot randomly assign bad institutions for some countries and good institutions for others. I mean, even if you could, it's hard to imagine something more unethical or kind of colossal scale of an unethical thing to do. So as a result, if you want to have something that is, at, quote, as good as random or as close to random as we possibly can, in a long-term historical case like this, you have to look for so-called natural experiments. Outcomes and behaviors and so on in history that, ma that make it as if there had been a randomization. And so that is what Asimoglu, um, Johnson, and Robinson sought to do in their pioneering work. And so they considered the fact that in colonial history, many countries around the world had been uh, colonized. And, um, uh, you know, obviously. And so when a colonial power has, if not completely free reign, very wide um, control over what formal institutions are um, established, it's something coming from the outside of the society. It's not an interaction between different kinds of development and, uh, you know, on, on the one hand um, and institutions on the other. Rather, we have the imposition of institutions from the outside. And in that sense, it's thought of like a natural experiment. Not exactly a randomized trial, but like, you know, you're going to give good institutions, quote unquote, give good institutions to some colonies, bad institutions to others, and let's see what happens. But how do you get anything out of that? Because you might think, well, we'll just, uh, as a colonizer, you know, um, if, if here's a country that would do really well for us with good institutions, well, we'll give them good institutions and, you know, um, and, and um, others, you know, that we don't care about bad institutions or something like that so that it's not really exogenous. So the idea is, can you find a determinant of how it is that the uh, colonizer imposed a, a good or bad institutions on countries that they didn't determine themselves. And so what the authors came up with was a rather brilliant idea, namely the mortality rates that were faced by colonizers. So relatively um, uh, recently when they were doing you know, th their work, but, but uh, since the 19, uh, in the 1990s, historians did exhaustive research to try to determine what the mortality rate was for uh, colonists um, in, um, in all the different areas of the world that were um, uh, colonized, you know, the Americas, Africa, and Asia. Um, and so that, um, you know, you want to get at the idea of cost of settlement. And so obviously there's nothing more costly than dying, uh, I guess, at least. Uh, um, and so um, the idea is that the higher the death rate of colonists, the more likely they are to put in bad institutions. Institutions where I think of as, you know, your incentive is to steal fast and get out, right? In which case, you are establishing what development economists call extractive institutions. And so the idea here is not uh, just or necessarily, or in any way primarily, um, extractive in the sense of, of, of extracting oil or some mineral ores, bauxite or whatever. Um, although they could, although people could be involved with uh, mining, they could be involved with agriculture and so on. It's really about extraction from people. So extractive institutions are those that extract uh, wealth from um, uh, people. And so that in contrast to that, we have inclusive institutions, which for the broadest swath, if you want, of the population, um, have uh, incentives to create wealth that they have some security in terms of, you know, beyond sort of reasonable taxation or whatever, it's not going to be um, expropriated. And so that when we had this data on mortality of settlers, or the authors did, it was possible to use those as a predictor, it's an exogenous variable, as a predictor for what kind of institution was um, created. It turned out that settler mortality was very correlated with the kinds of institutions that we have been talking about, um, such as restrictions on um, are on uh, executive um, authority, right? And so then what was uh, therefore um, found is that indeed um, the um, settler costs proxied by mortality um, you know, uh, did uh, predict the type of colonial regime 
And so it also turned out that the type of colonial regime was strongly predictive of post-colonial institutional quality. That is to say, um, very often, the, um, if you had extractive institutions after a colony became um, free from control of the colonizing country, the um, extractive institutions continued if you started extractive, that is to say, it might very well likely now be local extractors or possibly in tandem with foreign extractors, um, but uh, extractive uh, institutions tended to continue, whereas if there were inclusive institutions established by the colonizer after independence, inclusive institutions tended to continue. And so um, then we know certainly that uh, the data is quite clear that uh, the quality of institutions along the kinds of dimensions that I started out with predict strongly uh, whether there are well-functioning markets, predict um, um, whether or not there is a public goods um, um, provision. But, um, so these are some intermediary points, effective civil society, but the key point is that institutional quality um, predicts um, economic development outcomes, income, education, health, and so on. Right. So that underlying this, we have um, um, a kind of a, a rigorous um, econometric statistical um, uh, chain that uh, demonstrates pretty strongly that institutions cause development, whether for good or for ill. And so that's part of what the discussion in the section 2.8 is, um, is getting at. I'll say one other thing about this work before I talk about some other, uh, some other research, um, Eggerman and Sokoloff and, and Easterly, um, and, and that is that these um, authors, um, Asimoglu, Johnson, and, and Robinson, um, took this another step uh, further in which they tried to examine whether or not this information could say, say anything else about the role of geography. So one of their, uh, the points of their paper, the reversal of, of fortune, was to do just this. And so that, again, using this instrument of settler mortality, uh, they found that, first of all, the um, civilizations that were most advanced, um, by which they uh, defined as a population density and a um, uh, presence of cities, were those that were richer at the time of colonization but had more extractive institutions and then later on they turned out to be um, poorer as a result of the process of colonization whereas those that started without these features cities and high population ended up being richer and so that's uh, called the reversal of fortune and it is an important finding in its own light but it's also difficult for the geography interpretation because if before colonization it was geography that determined at least the relative ranking of countries uh, that emerged around the world, then you, know, you would expect that after colonization there should still be a similar ranking. Um, but actually what you find is a reversal in, of the ranking. So that's important evidence also. Um, and so that there are other factors, and so um, a key one is when the colonizer comes into um, an, an area that they, they colonize, they claim in the name of the, the Empire of Spain or, or whatever it may be, uh, based upon the labor abundances and comparative advantage that they find, there is um, an incentive to create either extractive institutions or inclusive institutions. So let me just take the um, example of potential comparative advantage uh, first. So in this regard, if an area has a comparative advantage in producing a good that has kind of constant returns to scale, where there are not agglomeration economies, then there's no reason to establish such a, a rigid and hierarchical structure. Example, in North America, the comparative advantage in agriculture was with respect to growing wheat. There were no real economies of scale in wheat, um, at least at this time. You know, so a family-sized farm 
was an efficient structure. If you have 10 wheat farms and you put them together in one system and have 10 families as your, as your um, um, tenants, it's generally less efficient if there are not increasing returns to scale because you also have the costs of supervision and so on. So in places like North America where the comparative advantage was in uh, wheat or something where there was not increasing returns to scale and if you wanted people to come in and produce, it was necessary perhaps with some, after some struggle, but it became necessary to provide good institutions, including some property rights protections and so on. Whereas in other geographic areas, th this was not true. So the classic fundamental, you know, the historical, most important historical example is, is sugarcane. So sugarcane was a primary activity that the colonists, uh, the, the colonizers, I should say, um, uh, uh, implemented in, in uh, much of the New World, um, uh, Latin America, the Caribbean. And it turned out that sugarcane did have increasing returns to scale. It was more profitable to produce at a plantation level than at a family farm level. And so that there was the incentive where the colonizer could to coerce indigenous people into working um, in, in, as indentured um, um, sl uh, slaves, in effect, um, in, uh, the, uh, on the condominium system and so on, or if they died or were not there in the numbers, um, this is what uh, generated and, and um, gave uh, rise to the transatlantic uh, slave um, uh, trade system, which had obviously horrific effects on people that still reverberate throughout the Americas really uh, to this day. And so, um, as a result, you saw extractive institutions because of this comparative advantage, really underlying factor, because that's what gave people the incentive for what they chose as colonizers, right? Comparative advantage um, in sugarcane growing areas to create extractive institutions, comparative advantage in wheat growing areas, just to kind of simplify a broader idea in um, places like North, uh, in North America, 13 American colonies, the Canadian colonies or whatever, right? And so that one key impact here is that where you have these um, extractive institutions based on agriculture of this kind, there's going to be very high inequality. And so the idea is that, um, that uh, if uh, inequality is also to be one of the central predictors of economic development uh, performance, here's a place where you would see it, and here's an opportunity to, to test it, because comparative, comparative advantage in what you um, produce is not something chosen by the European colonial powers who came to control North and South America. And so um, William Easterly was one of those who contributed in this area, and so he used the percent of a country's land area that is suitable to producing sugarcane as a ratio with respect to percent of the area suitable for producing wheat, an exogenous variable, as an instrument for predicting the amount of inequality in the past. It was pretty effective and it showed that high inequality does predict, indeed does cause through this analysis, um, lower levels of inequality, of, of uh, development. Right, so that it, this is a, a way of, um, of uh, determining the role of um, inequality. So that's comparative advantage. I should say something about um, labor um, abundances. So when there were uh, denser populations of indigenous people who survived the, the colonization um, experience um, as indigenous people did not in, in, um, in many areas, um, then there was a great incentive to um, take over an existing tribute system so that it is with a more settled, relatively more, relatively more urban-based um, um, economy, more densely-based economy, where it was common to find uh, more hierarchical social orders in which there was a tribute system in which people were required to, to, uh, to uh, um, um, give such that the central um, empire got the uh, resources 
if you're a colonizer and you are able to conquer such a place, the incentive is just to take over this convenient tribute system that already exists, such as the Spanish did in, in Mexico and Peru, for example. And so that um, labor abundances mattered. Clearly here, you are pursuing an extractive rather than, rather than an inclusive approach to institutions, just kind of taking over the extraction that was already there for the waiting. And also in these areas, um, if there are also if there's also um, um, high value mining to be done, gold, silver, but others also, uh, then you, you have every incentive to have forced or coerced labor to work for you in those areas. Um, if you don't have that, such as one did not have in uh, in, in um, uh, North America, there is really no choice for the colonizer but to create inclusive institutions. So very importantly, it's not because the English settlers were inherently nicer than the, than the, uh, than the conquistadors. Um, it is rather that they had different incentives, at least this is what the analysis shows. Um, certainly the, the, um, the English settlers in, in other areas, such as the, um, the, the Caribbean, uh, were not uh, particularly nicer than the Spanish, right? So it's, it's a response um, to, uh, to incentives. So that this is a way of understanding together how it is that institutions, along with the associated but also independently important role of extreme inequality, are clearly understood now to have causal effect on um, development. Unfortunately, changing and improving institutions is an extremely difficult thing to do. Institutions are very resistant to reform, and for a very simple reason. If you have extractive institutions, then the extractors who are powerful have every incentive not to have those institutions changed. I mean, in a nutshell, it's really, in some ways, that uh, simple. So that this is part of the big picture. There's more details in the section, but I'm going to uh, leave it here, and there's lots here to discuss and consider. Thank you.